um, they'll continue to admit people and, and people do, if I could just say, sometimes people's um, internet crashes or whatever, feel free to rejoin. We'll let people back in from the waiting room and things. We'll monitor this. So don't, don't, be, don't be alarmed about it. But if you could please be really careful, if you do crash out and come back in, that your mic is muted because you will come in in the middle of people speaking and so forth. So that would be great. Right, well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Marcia Meskin and I'm from the Institute of the, uh, Advanced Studies here at Oakley University. And we are in occupation in our actual building. This is the first time in four months. So not only is this a, a, a great marker of our third time theme event, but it is a marker of our, our occupation of a different space. And so we are very, very thrilled um, to have um, this event happening today. Um, I'm only going to say two very brief things. One is, please do keep the chat open and feel free to join in with that as, as we're going. Um, even even from, uh, from the experience of the last two events we've had, but also from the experience just yesterday of the coffee morning welcoming some of our fellows, and we have seven vibrant and really interesting fellows today, so it's a very packed program. Um, this is a really exciting uh, theme. And it, it generates conversation across a whole range of different disciplines and a whole range of different approaches. So please feel free to participate in that conversation through the chat throughout. Um, and then I'm gonna say something else which is uh, very particular today, which is that many of you um, having registered and so forth will have had some contact over the course of the last few weeks with uh, Laura Dale, who is facilitating for us um, today and has been with the IAS pretty much since its start. This is Laura's last event with the IAS because Laura is leaving um, after this. And so I really want to say um, in, a, in a very formal sense, because okay, so obviously we will, we will do things informally, but Laura has been absolutely critical to the IAS in the time that um, we've been operating. And you know we would never have got through this pandemic period without unbelievable extra effort from Laura in terms of her facilitation of all of these events bringing fellows virtually, connecting all these time zones, finding out about the things. So I actually want to say thank you to Laura because um, she has also had her COVID vaccine. She may not quite make it to the end of this event. So rather than leave it to the end, I'm gonna say it now. So thank you very much, Laura, we appreciate it. And I'm gonna turn over to Steve Rothberg, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research here at Loughborough University, who's going to welcome everyone on behalf of the university. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Marsha. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, so, a uh, very warm welcome uh, to everybody. I'm delighted just to, to be able to join you at, at this point uh, to say hello uh, and to say a few words about, about the IAS. It's been great watching everybody arrive um, in this electronic format. So, we were spotting people coming in from Nigeria, Argentina, uh, Portugal, and it's certainly been one of the great successes of, of the Institute of Advanced Studies, but also one of the uh, great aspects of this particular way of uh, delivering workshops that we're, we're able um, conveniently to attract such uh, uh, an excellent and, and international audience to, uh, to our event. So uh, wherever you are based currently, um, a very warm welcome, great to have you uh, with us today. I, I just do a, a very quick bit of of, of history because um, uh, those of us, uh, myself, uh, Marsha, um, uh, who've been involved with Institute of Advanced Studies for, for all or most of its uh, life at, at Loughborough, are very proud of, of what we've achieved uh, to this point. So we launched our Institute of Advanced Studies in May 2017. Um, so it's still, uh, you know, relatively new activity for us at Loughborough, but at the last count, and this count is out of date, uh, but the last count, we'd welcomed 214 visiting fellows from 35 countries. Uh, and it'd be absolutely true to say that IES, the Institute of Advanced Studies, had really won a place in the intellectual heart of, of colleagues right across our uh, two campuses in the, in the UK. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's uh, all for us IES events are a, a reason for kind of great celebration and, and really important uh, moments in the uh, in the research life of the university. Um, as Marsha was alluding to, and she is in the home of the Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, International House, and that's great to see uh, because for obvious reasons, we, we haven't been occupying our home uh, very much uh, recently, uh, but um, we've had our home for a couple of years, um, symbolically located right at the center uh, of our Midlands campus, 
Uh, and sometime soon, I hope lots of you will be able to come and join us uh, there uh, for real. Over the course of the last year, we've also added a competitive residential fellowship scheme uh, into uh, the Institute. And again, that's been another very significant uh, step uh, for us. And if, if that sort of thing is of interest to you, then, uh, you know, we welcome applications uh, to that when we, uh, when we seek them. One of the really brilliant things about being in my job as a Pro Vice Chancellor for Research is the time I can spend listening to colleagues describe their passion for research in a, in a really diverse range of disciplines. Um, but this has really been taken to another level uh, through the Institute of, of Advanced Studies. And you know, we bring colleagues together both from uh, across Loughborough, uh, across the UK, across the worldwide uh, academic community um, to talk about uh, matters of, of mutual interest, but to discuss that as uh, representatives of, of disciplines that don't routinely uh, come together. And that really has been the magic uh, of what we've done in IAS, bringing people together across disciplines, bringing people together uh, across the globe, uh, together with people from all disciplines in, in our own university. It's just been such a, a marvellous uh, combination uh, to uh, to have been able to to witness and uh, and to have played a part in, in making happen it's absolutely fabulous so a very warm welcome to everybody who's who's here today especially those guests from outside of Loughborough uh, particularly warm welcome of course to those external speakers uh, today without whom we wouldn't have an event so so thank you uh, I'll leave the formal introductions uh, to Ariana but um, uh, let me say how grateful I am to you for participating in our events I'm sure you're going to have an absolutely fascinating Friday afternoon and I'll hand you over to Ariana at this point. Uh, have a good day. Thank you, Steve. It is my absolute pleasure to share uh, this uh, enthusiasm and to chair this wonderful, wonderful uh, trip, a wonderful journey through several disciplines we have today. We have uh, literature, linguistics, physics, communication, semiotics, philosophy, and much more. Uh, fantastic speakers, the running order will be Professor Bowen, Professors Balbi and Dikitinskaya, Professor Warwick, Professor Bateman, and then Professors Usatenko and Jampolski. Uh, I'll try to keep a strict um, timekeeping <laughs> because we have such a rich program. So each paper will be um, 20 minutes long, and then we have 10 minutes after each paper for questions. Please feel free to raise your hand or to ask your questions um, in the chat. I will be monitoring both and my colleague um, in this uh, adventure, uh, Peter Kowalik, will also be helping me monitoring the chat. Um, uh, I just don't want to, to take any more time. We will have a final discussion around uh, four o'clock and we will have a break, uh, more or less around 2.20 to uh, 2.30. And now let's just start with this wonderful journey, as I said. It's my pleasure to introduce you first to Professor John Bowen and to his paper, Just in Time. Thank you, Ariana. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Laura, uh, and everybody at Loughborough. I'm only sorry uh, not, not to be there in the flesh, but it's so good to see, see you all and so many people here. Um, I'm going to be talking today um, mainly about Dickens. Um, and, uh, but what I want to kind of argue, I think, has consequences much more widely, not just for 19th century fiction more, uh, more generally, but also because Dickens pioneers both um, a serial fiction and multi-plotting um, for many of our understandings of um, fictional form uh, and not just literary fictional form in the 19th and 20th centuries. So I'm going to be talking mainly about Dickens um, but and so I've tried to give examples from relatively familiar texts. So I'm going to be thinking about time in Dickens uh, and I'll be talking uh, quite a bit about A Christmas Carol for example and Bleak House and the famous uh, ending of A Tale of Two Cities. So they're not, these aren't esoteric bits of, uh, uh, of Dickens' oeuvre, uh, but they have consequences, I think, that ripple out uh, quite widely. Um, I had a choice today that either you could see my lovely shining face or you could see all the lovely shining quotes uh, from Dickens. So what I'm gonna do um, is, is share my screen with you uh, and then just um, start, to, start to talk through the kind of uh, skeleton of examples that I've given um, and I've there are also certain 
conceptual or theoretical kind of interests here, particularly um, uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, Jacques Derrida, and more recently Martin Hagland's work. Uh, and, and they, they I hope, um, uh, presences in the paper, uh, but, but also accessible to those who don't, uh, don't aren't, are coming from slightly different uh, conceptual uh, direction. So I'm going to share my screen now and then uh, uh, talk about, um, I mean, the, the paper is called Just in, in Time. And the reason it's called that is because the question of justice uh, and the ways in which Dickens' work uh, disrupts sequential and historicizing time to figure possibilities of a kind of ethical and more than ethical call or address to the reader is kind of at the heart of what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'll share my screen with you now. Uh, is that okay? Can everybody see that? Um, if someone could just give me a quick thumbs up, that would be very helpful. Thank you, Ariana. Okay, so these topics of time and the ethical are related to questions of memory in Dickens. Memory is both sedimented negative repetition and as potentially ethically, socially, and indeed politically uh, transformative. Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, for example, is caught within a repetitious death-dealing negation. Bar humbug, bar humbug, bar humbug. What violently breaks Scrooge from his negativity is a radical temporal disorder. Twelve? It was past two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong. An icicle must have got into the works. Through the temporal derangement wrought by the three spirits who visit him, Scrooge re-encounters earlier events in his life in a kind of fantasized, virtual, non-subjective memory that enables him to break decisively into a radically different relationship, both to temporality and to others. I don't know what day of the month it is, says Scrooge. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. Never mind, I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. Hello, whoop, whoop. Hello there. That's Scrooge at the end. Um, this magnificent um, ecstatic in both senses, standing outside time and utterly joyful, this ecstatic moment immediately follows the climactic encounter with his own mortality when he confronts his gr own grave and promises, I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. The kind of social justice and ethical responsibility to the other, epitomized by Scrooge at the end of the story, rests precisely on a transformed engagement with temporality, memory, and mortality, and ecstatic striving of past, present, future, simultaneously subjective and not, both and neither, a matter of spirits and of matter. But that's not just a thing for Scrooge or simply a property of the mimesis, but something for the reader too. In the preface, Dickens writes, I've endeavoured in this ghostly little book to raise the ghost of an idea made which will not put my readers out of humour with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me, may it haunt their houses pleasantly, and no one wish to lay it. It's not just Scrooge who's being haunted. The reading of the text is also a haunting, uncannily disruptive of, of our conventional temporal orderings, an event that is always coming and yet not there, both present and absent, seasonal and not seasonal, archetypally literary, in short. Nor are these remarks simply paratextual, as they recur in more uncanny form in the text and outside the text itself. When the first spirit appears uh, to Scrooge, for example, curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, st starting up into a half recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them as close to it as I am now to you, and I'm standing in the spirit at your elbow. The narrator's spiritual elbowing occurs each time the text is read. Writing as haunting isn't docile to temporal sequence and position. It's a kind of none time or a time of reading. 
And these are not isolated instances or examples in Dickens' work. They particularly occur when questions of justice and ethical and social responsibility arrive. This kind of temporal address slash event is in many accounts of 19th century fiction, particularly realist and historicist ones, seriously underplayed. George Lukacs's account of the historical novel sees an essential link between realism, historicism, and quote, the ruthlessly truthful investigation and disclosure of all the contradictions of progress. There is, he writes, no criticism of the present from which it will not shrink. My argument is that those modes, historicism and realism, and criticism of the present on the other, are not so readily reconciled. So let's now look at some of the ways that this happens in Dickens' work. Uh, critical accounts of uh, time and temporality in the 19th century novel are dominated by two paradigms, I think. First, historicism, which, like Lukács, sees the fictional conquest of everyday life occurring through the embedding of popular life in history. As Perry Anderson puts it, the historical novel is not a specific or delimited genre or subgenre of the novel to court, rather it's simply a pathbreaker or precursor of the great realistic novels of the 19th century. Temporal order, progress, causality, social critique, realism and historicism are organically linked for Lukács. A second view might be that of Elizabeth Ehrmacht in the English novel in history, who sees the distinctive achievement of 19th century fiction as the creation of a quote, neutral temporal order in which simultaneous actions can be juxtaposed and coordinated. This is, she argues, uh, kin in time to the discovery or invention of perspective or space in the Renaissance. Significant parts of Dickens' work aren't like that at all and have a much more disrupted and disrupting relationship to temporal sequence and coordination. Uh, and his social, I want to argue, his social and political radicalism are allied to and indeed dependent on this. Dickens' work is radically temporally innovative in ways that often derange the kinds of temporal order that critics wish to discover or impose. Time appears in an extraordinary variety of ways in his work, both explicitly and thematically, and formally and structurally. Uh, that matters because Dickens is, in world historical terms, the, sim the single most influential of all 19th century novelists, supreme in England, massively reprinted across North America, translated across Europe, endlessly dramatized, extracted, plagiarized, pastiched, illustrated, acted, quoted, adapted, and read. Death, famously wrote Walter Benjamin, is the sanction of everything that the storyteller can tell. He has borrowed his authority from death. The meaning of a character's life is revealed, or his life he means a character's life, is revealed only in his death. But the order of the clauses, together with the colon that divides them in the mighty opening little sentence of A Christmas Carol, might make us pause before we agree with Benjamin's aphorism. Marley was dead to begin with. Death is not an end point here, but an inauguration to be followed by another quasi death also a beginning, that of Scrooge, another death to begin with. Scrooge sees his grave and death at the end of stage four, but is then, this is then erased in stage five, not however in a rebirth to eternity or resurrection or salvation, but to secular ongoing life. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew. As Martin Hagland in Dying for Time has argued of Nabokov, Wolf, and Proust, what we have here is not a desire to transcend time, but a continued investment in and desire for ongoing temporal life. Simultaneously, to use Hagland's terms, chronophilic and chronophobic. Dickens' strange temporalities also appear generically and modally in the strategic deployment of Gothic, those haunting, uncanny, repetitious modes 
within allegedly historical texts. It appears through the importance of non-human agents, such as Grip, the talking raven, in Barnaby Road. It appears in the apparently unpatterned use of past and present tense in altern alternating groups of chapters in Our Mutual Friend and the Mystery of Edwin Drood. And in the ap essential, absolute secret, unknown to history, in A Tale of Two Cities, that strangest of historical novels. A wonderful fact to reflect upon, that every human creature is constituted to be that profound secret and mystery to every other. It is the inexorable consolidation and perpetuation of the secret that was always in that individuality and which I shall carry in mind to my life's end. In any of the burial places of the city through which I pass, is there a sleeper more inscrutable than its busy inhabitants are in their innermost personality to me or than I am to them? So we have then in Dickens' work, histories and narrations that are not necessarily sequential or linear, with agents that are not necessarily human, that have a radical secrecy embedded within them, and which at times have fictional agents or characters whose function is precisely to be indistinguishable from each other. The interchangeable Carton and Dano in A Tale of Two Cities, for example. These texts are irrigated by, and at times think of themselves as being, haunting ghosts and doubles. And historical fiction and its criticism are regularly and inventively disrupted, exceeded and diverted in Dickens' writing. Clocks, for example, rarely strike at the same time in Dickens' work, as for example, um, in his 1867 collaboration with Wilkie Collins, No Thoroughfare. Day of the month and year, November the 30th, 1835 London time, by the great clock of St. Paul's, 10 at night. All the lesser London churches strain their metallic throats. Some flippantly begin before the heavy bell of the great cathedral, some tardily begin three, four, half a dozen strokes behind it. All are in sufficiently near accord to leave a resonance in the air, as if the winged father who devours his children had made a sounding sweep with his gigantic scythe in flying over the city. Time does not coincide with itself here is out of joint, but is also a monstrous hybrid allegory, simultaneously both a scythe-bearing old father time and like Saturn, a cannibalistic father who devours his own children. Such inventive strangeness has consequences both for narrative form and for their ethical, social and political consequences. It's not simply a formal or generic matter. For Dickens, the text's social or ethical projection or address is deeply tied up with questions of time, at the end of our time, whose ending, set in various imaginary or possible futures, is markedly different from what one might expect from most accounts of uh, realist fiction. Dear reader, it rests with you and me, whether in our two fields of action, similar things shall be or not. Let them be. We shall sit with lighter bosoms on the hearth to see the ashes of our fires turn grey and cold. A resting and a letting be that is also a projection forwards. The question of how to be just in time, it seems, entails a radical rethinking or unsettlement of time. The opening of a tale of two cities is so familiar that its full self-deleting oddity is often ignored. It was the best of time. It was the worst of time. The age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. 
this is a kind of hyperbolic deconstruction of the very idea of period and periodicity through the evocation of a time or times that is or are simultaneously both and neither two ages, epochs and seasons, spring and winter, and the beginning and end, all bizarrely enough, also like the present period, whenever that may be, we may be reading. Everything and nothing was and is before us in this radically disjunctive beginning to a novel which limit tests what lies within, beyond, and at the borders of the historic and periodic. In The Gift of Death, Jacques Derrida, paraphrasing and discussing Jan Potochka's heretical essays in the philosophy of history, writes, history can neither be, can be neither a decidable object nor a totality capable of being mastered precisely because it is tied to responsibility, to faith, and to the gift. To responsibility in the experience of absolute decisions, decision made outside of knowledge or given rules, made therefore through the very ordeal of the undecidable. To religious faith through a form of involvement with the other, this is a venture into absolute risk beyond knowledge and certainty. To the gift and to the gift of death, puts me into relation with the transcendent of the other, with God as self and goodness, and that gives me what it gives me through a new experience of death. The gift of death, Don Elamor, would be this marriage of responsibility and faith. History depends on such an excessive beginning. That set of claims takes us very close to Dickens' understanding in A Tale of Two Cities, uh, of the many ecstatic sacrificial, deadly, or disjunctive occasions of the book, I want to take a single passage. To do so, I have to sacrifice almost everything else. Lucy, the novel's heroine and embodiment of bourgeois eternal virtue, witnesses the revolutionary dance of the Carmagnol. No fight could have been half so terrible as this dance, such grace as was visible in it made it the uglier, showing how warped and perverted all things good by nature would become. The maidenly bosom bared to this, the pretty almost child's head thus distracted, the delicate foot mincing in this slough of blood and dirt, were types of the disjointed time. The quotation ends at a moment of temporal allegory or typification. The bosom, the head and foot are, quote, types of the disjointed time. The phrase disjointed time, of course, invokes Hamlet, time is out of joint, a figure of temporal dislocation, which as Gerrida's Spectres of Marx demonstrates has powerfully uncanny and disruptive in Marx's historicist understanding of political revolution. It simultaneously animates, condenses, and spectralizes it. Only in a vision of time as radically, inexorably disjoint, it appears, can we glimpse the possibility of historical being. Dickens, uh, in A Tale of Two Cities, as elsewhere, is deeply troubled um, by, by what we can think of as cycles of mimetic violence that follow in Ejira, the kind of accelerating spirals of revenge that seem to be the driving force of modern political revolution. Dr. Manette, who's um, the father-in-law of Charles Darnay, at a moment of desperation in his imprisonment, uh, denounces not just um, the, the two brothers who are rapists and murderers who imprisoned them, but also, quote, their descendants to the last of their race. And then 30 years later, their descendants include his beloved son-in-law, Darnay. Uh, Dickens' way out of this is for the wastrel, uh, Sidney Carton, to substitute his own body sacrifice it um, for Darnay's near identical one to just save the life rival. Um, and at the end of the novel, uh, as he dies, there's a transition to the celebrated ending. It's a far, far better thing but at the moment. And it's a kind of climax, clash, or cut from history to the very different temporal ordering of prophecy. The murmuring of many voices 
the upturning of many faces, the pressing on of many footsteps in the outskirts of the crowd, so that it swells forward in a mass like one great heave of water, all flashes away, as it were, from uh, Carlton's point of view. 23, that's his number. They said of him, you see the change in the nature of the narration, they said of him about the city that night, that it was the peacefulest man's face ever beheld. Many added that he looked sublime and prophetic. One of the most remarkable sufferers by the same act, a woman, had asked at the foot of the same scaffold not long before to be allowed to write down the thoughts that were inspiring her. If he had given any utterance to his and they were prophetic, they would have been these. And that leads to the far, far better thing moment. But nothing happens here. Carton is said to look prophetic, second-hand account, oral narration, either and both more authentic or mere rumour and gossip. There's then a scene of writing by an unnamed woman. If Carton had given utterance, there's no suggestion that he does, they would have been these thoughts. It's a kind of virtual speech, a quasi-utterance, speech under erasure, both prophetic and not, said and unsaid, written and spoken, Carton's and not Carton's, male and female, all of which is inevitably and invariably abolished in any film or theatrical adaptation. Carton's words, but not his words, are about justice, and in the novel it is only Carton's heroic self-sacrifice that can arrest the cycle of revolutionary violence, spiralling reciprocity of vengeance. But Dickens' greatest meditation on temporality um, his 1854 novel, uh, Bleak House, from its very first pages onwards, is troubled by the question of justice and how it might appear or fail to appear on earth and in time. The search for justice in the shape of the John Dyson John lawsuit, lawsuit seems interminable. Justice never appears on time, appears too late or not at all. Miss Flight, for example, absurdly, pitifully expects a judgment on the day of judgment. The injustice of the Court of Chancery stems from, is a matter of, time. Its apparent interminability, its radical excess of the human lives it consumes. For a little plaintiff or defendant who has promised a new rocking horse when John Dice and John Dice should be settled, has grown up, possessed himself of a real horse, and trotted away into the other world. An entire life in a single sentence, a kind of death sentence. There is, of course, another death in the book, that of Joe, the abjectly poor crossing sweeper, who's been achieved and achieved, plus by one of you, nixed by another on you, so I'm worried to, to skin and bones. The chapter in which Joe dies is called Joe's Will, and it's worth asking what exactly he bequeaths the novel, and thus its readers, in our thinking about justice and time. It's one of the most celebrated moments in English fiction, not least because of these words after Joe has died. Dead your majesty, dead my lords and gentlemen, dead right reverence and wrong reverence of every order. Dead men and women born with heavenly compassion in your heart and dying thus around us every day. It is, as Judith Wilt puts it, the most profoundly direct address to the aggregate other in all of Dickens' work. Joe, through the metonymy that is so marked a feature of the novel, stands for the countless other degraded and exploited poor, then in Victorian London, and in and through the narrator's present tense, now, and now, and now. One of the very final things that Joe says before he dies is to ask, let me lay here quiet and not be chivvy no more, falters Joe. A bit of a kind, any person is a passing nigh while you for to sleep, as just to say to Mr. Sangsby, Joe, what he known once is a moving on right forwards with his duty. Joe, when he speaks of his imminent death, uses a word gist. It appears only three times in the novel, all on his lips. The first is when Lady Dedlock asks of her dead lover whether he looked when he was living so very ill and poor. Oh, gist, Joe. The second is when a servant asked Joe in a small act of hospitality and solidarity among the poor, the hungry, gist, Joe again replies. On both, another, on both occasions, 
helping another, receiving a gift. Gist is Joe's way of saying right, just so, or simply yes. Yes, he did. Yes, I'm hungry. Gist, Joe's yes, is also, of course, another way of saying just, in a word that sounds like justice folded in on itself and thus opening and reopening endlessly. Joe's brought an end here to a death in time that is at least one potential beginning for the reader of a duty and more than duty, as she too, like Joe, moves on right forwards with her duty in fiction and not in fiction, in time and out of time, fussed and nixed, just in time. Thank you very, very much, John. We have time for just one quick question, I'm afraid, but we'll have more time around four o'clock during the, the discussion. And it's a beautiful question by Katie Wing. She says, clocks rarely strike at the same time in Dickens. Coordinated universal time had not arrived in the mid 19th century. Has our perception of time changed as a result? Yes, enormously. And of course, I mean, railway time is so significant in the 19th century. And um, there are these extraordinary maps of 19th century railway time where uh, some towns retain their own time. So there's Oxford time, whereas there's also coordinated time elsewhere. And of course, that's something that goes back to the French Revolution and the attempt to impose a decimal clock as well, and a whole set of political consequences about the idea of a kind of year zero. The territory of cities is, is deeply deeply uh, interested in. Um, so, um, yes, but also I think I want to kind of make a bigger claim, I think, here about, about um, uh, historicism. So this, in one way, this is a paper about 19th century historicism, but it may be a more general paper about, about historicism. Um, and the, the, the quote from Potocka here, or the, the Derrida's account of Potocka, this strange double-voiced passage there, I think, um, uh, shows some of the quite deeply disruptive um, force that these texts retain for a lot of our embedded assumptions about, um, about what the nature of the relationship between the, to put it in a kind of quick shorthand, the textual and the historical. Wonderful. Thank you, John. I think this is such a wonderful workshop that 